Well, all the legal punches have been thrown, the bell has now sounded, and the decision is going to be scored by the judge. If you're wondering what I'm referring to, no, it's not a fight in the middle of the ring, per se. It's a fight in the courtroom. The closing arguments were made in the disqualification hearing of Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade with regard to the case that they are trying in Fulton County regarding former President Trump and other witnesses. So what happened today? Hang on, folks. We're going to get into all this in just one second. My name is Brian Trippett. I am your front porch conservative. Step on up to my electronic front porch and let's talk. Fulton County Judge Scott McAfee heard the closing arguments today in the case of whether or not District Attorney Fonnie Willis and lead prosecutor Nathan Wade should be disqualified from the case against former President Donald Trump and other defendants on RICO charges under Georgia law. And I want to do a quick reaction video to kind of give you a flavor for what happened and give you my take on what's going on. So let's start, as we are wont to do, with an article from the news, and we go to the post-millennial. Headline, attorneys argue appearance of conflict of interest between Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade can disqualify them. Judge could decide today. Closing arguments in the case to disqualify Fonnie Willis from the Georgia Rico case involving Trump and other co-defendants was heard on Friday. Article written by Hannah Nightingale. We read the following. On Friday, closing arguments were heard in the case to disqualify Fonnie Willis from the Georgia RICO case involving Trump and other co-defendants. Before hearing closing arguments in the case to disqualify, Judge Scott McAfee indicated he may be able to make a decision in the case today. Quote, I think we've reached the point where I'd like to hear more of how the legal arguments apply to what has already been presented, and it may already be possible for me to make a decision without those needing to be material to that decision, McAfee said. Attorneys pushing for the disqualification of Willis argued two concepts, the appearance of conflict and the forensic misconduct pieces of the case. John Merchant, a defense attorney for Mike Roman, argued that just, quote, an appearance of conflict of interest between Willis and prosecutor Nathan Wade was sufficient to disqualify her from the case. Quote, I want to make clear to the court that the law in Georgia suggests and is very clear that we can demonstrate an appearance of a conflict of interest and that is sufficient, Merchant said. The reason why the appearance of the conflict is so prescient in this case is that because if the court allows this kind of behavior to go on and allows DAs across the state by its order to engage in these kind of activities, the entire public confidence in the system will be shot, Merchant said, and the integrity of the system will be undermined. Merchant also said there's a good chance that if McAfee rules alongside the state, defendant Mike Roman would request a new trial on the matter. Quote, if this court allows this kind of behavior to go on, Merchant said of Willis, the entire public confidence in the system will be shot and the integrity of the system will be undermined. Sadow, an attorney for Trump, spoke on Willis's appearance at a church in Atlanta in January in which she called into question Wade being, quote, attacked. Sadow said Willis could have told members of the church that she had a romantic relationship with Wade, but she didn't and instead, quote, chose to deflect, choosing to pull out the race card and the God card. That's what she did. Sadow also called into question her use of cash to allegedly pay back Wade for the trips they took. Sadow stated, quote, it's been proven, I think virtually beyond any doubt, that the relationship occurred prior to November 1 of 2021. We've got all these records showing from Mr. Wade about the payment for these trips, for the cruises, for the flights, all this stuff. What's the only way is that they sat around and met together before they testified to come up with their story. What's the only way they could save themselves? Pay no attention to the records, pay no attention to the airlines, and pay no attention to the flights and vacations and the cruises. I paid him back in cash. Show us your receipts. Where did you take the cash out of the bank? I don't have any, Sadow said. Attorney for the state Adam Abate argued that the defense attorneys have not shown how Willis and Wade's relationship has affected the defendant's constitutional rights. Quote, There is absolutely no evidence that the defendants in this case 
their due process rights have been marred in absolutely any way. There is zero evidence, not a single shred of evidence, was produced to any of the exhibits or the witness testimony showing their constitutional rights, their due process rights, were at all affected by the relationship which began in March of 2020 with Mr. Willis and excuse me, Miss Willis and Mr. Wade. And because of that, the motions to disqualify should be denied. Okay, let us get into all of this. For my part, I did my best to try and watch the, the closing arguments hearing. And again, I always add the caveat, I'm no lawyer. I'm just a person that reads the news, tries to watch what I see and make my observations thereon. From my perspective, here's what I saw. Two things. Much like that old Dickens novel, uh, Tale of Two Cities, that you can make the case that was the case for the lawyers. The lawyers for the defense, Sadow and others, argued, I think, cleanly, efficiently. They made their presentations. They were crisp. They were to the point. And they tried to establish, and I think for my part, successfully so, that if Georgia law only requires just the appearance of of conflict of interest, that that is sufficient under Georgia law for the judge to make a determination that he could conceivably remove Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade from this case. Now, there's a lot of evidence that was presented in the preceding days, and these arguments more or less summed up everything that they presented. Now, on the other side of that argument was Mr. Adam Abate, who was representing the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. I almost felt sorry for him. A, I think he had a much bigger hill to climb, because remember, all the defense attorneys have to show is the appearance of a conflict of interest. And if that is the standard under Georgia law, that either you have the appearance of conflict of interest or you have proof of the conflict of interest, if all you need is appearance, then it looks like by preponderance, they've got everything they need. Abate has got to somehow show that, no, all of this doesn't matter. It doesn't matter at all. There's no reason for them to be disqualified. Now, I say that the arguments for the defense attorneys, Stephen Sadow, among others, was they were crisp, they were clean, they were effective, they were straight to the point. Abate's argument on behalf of the district attorney's office, at least from my observations anyway, seemed to meander around. There were a lot of case law presented, a lot of facts, but it just seems like the presentation wasn't as sharp as it could have been. And I just wonder how that affects him with the judge, especially in light of some of the questioning. But we'll take a look at some of what happened. So let's go to some video clips. We start with closing argument uh, by the attorney McDougal representing Jeffrey Clark. I want to play you just a little bit of what he said, because I think this is going to be one of the last things that sticks in Judge McAfee's mind. Folks, take a listen to this. The problem here is the DA cannot distinguish between her personal interests and ambitions on the one hand and her public duties as a prosecutor on the other, and apparently neither can, neither can anyone else in their office. Of the six conflicts I've identified, only one is subject to a conflict in the evidence. This is a case study in what happens when you operate under a conflict of interest. It's put an irreparable stain on the case. Think of the message that would be sent if they were not disqualified. If this is tolerated, we'll get more of it. This office is a global laughing stock because of their conduct. They should be disqualified and the case should be dismissed. Well, I'll give the old boy this. He's got dramatic flair, but is that going to be enough to do it? Yeah, it remains to be seen. Now, I've all we've heard a lot of the name Stephen Sado, who's the attorney for Trump. And he was just as effective. Now, the clip that I'm going to show you is in rebuttal to uh, Deputy District Attorney Abate's statements. So take a listen to this. It runs about 45 seconds, but this is very, very effective. So check this out because this is pretty good. Motive. That's it. An issue. Whose motive in this case is the strongest? Bonnie Willis. Nathan Wade, because if they, if they testify truthfully on every point, 
What happens if the relationship started before November 1st? They get disqualified. Who has the best motive of anyone to lie? They do. Who has the most at stake to lie? They do. Who wants to stay on this case for whatever the financial reason may be? They do. And more. Thank you, Mr. Sena. Okay. So as you can see, pretty effective stuff. Now, how effective? Well, that's sort of dependent upon the judge. To give you an idea of what it was like on the other side, I'm going to show you a clip of Adam Abonte, the deputy district attorney representing Fonnie Willis's office in this case. Like I say, it just seemed like a lot of what he was doing was meandering about. Now, don't get me wrong. I almost feel bad for the poor guy because he had a horrible job. But to be perfectly honest, the way he was presenting himself, speech patterns, everything else. Yeah, I know that might sound petty on my part. and might not mean a lot toward the materiality of what he's presenting. But appearance in, in a courtroom sometimes is just as powerful as the facts you've got. And the way he presented his case just came off as sloppy. But I'll let you make that determination for yourself. Folks, take a listen to this. Of all of the witnesses and through the evidence um, that Your Honor heard was that there wasn't an actual conflict, that the defense failed to provide any sort of actual conflict uh, in relation to uh, Miss Wade's, uh, I guess, the Miss Wade. Yeah, that's not exact. It always almost feels like a Freudian slip. But on the other hand, eh, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, let's continue. Relationship uh, that uh, transpired um, from uh, the relationship between her uh, and Mr. Wade, and that there was absolutely no evidence of a financial uh, benefit that she gained uh, as it relates to the prosecution um, of this case and the ultimate outcome of the case. Um, the corroboration of all of that is the things that Your Honor is very much aware. Okay, now that's just a little bit of a body. He was up there for good at least half hour, 45 minutes. I'm not the only one that more or less came to these conclusions. There's a lot of different posts on social media about the arguments that were made on both sides, but I'll show you just one in particular, which is kind of is reflective of my feelings about the whole thing. I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on Twitter, but my observation is that Adam Abate currently giving closing arguments for Fani is horrible. And I can't disagree with that assessment. I mean, here's where it's at from my perspective. The problem that Fani Willis and Nathan Wade have is this. I don't know that they can demonstrate that the relationship did not start in the time, or let me rephrase that. They say their relationship started in 2022. Well, that seems to be out the window in light of Robin Yurti's testimony on the first day and now the text messages that are in the judge's possession from Terrence Bradley, Nathan Wade's old law partner, in which he says, oh yeah, their relationship started back in 2019 when she was a judge. Plus, on top of that, you've got the fact that the story between Nathan Wade and Fonnie Willis is, yes, we went on trips together, but we split the costs. Okay, fine, you split the cost. Show me how you, how you reimbursed. Well, I paid him in cash. Can't you produce records to that? Well, the cash came from my house. Hmm. Now, the issue basically comes down to this. Did she hire Nathan Wade to be the prosecutor on this case and in doing so enjoyed a financial benefit doing so, hence the conflict of interest? Looks like there's a strong enough case to be made that that's actually what happened here. Now, remember, there's two standards that one could meet in order for this case to be made to disqualify Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade. You can either prove there's the conflict of interest or you can show there's the appearance thereof. And again, as I said earlier in the video, if the standard that is being gone for here by the defense attorneys is the appearance of conflict of interest, for my part, I think they've got it. Now, all this is dependent upon Judge Scott McAfee, and he said that he'd rule in about two weeks. Now, that sort of begs the question. If he does rule that they're disqualified, what happens to the case? Does it stay in Fulton County? Does it go somewhere else? Well, Andrew McCarthy of Fox News has an answer for that question, or at least a theory on what might yet happen. He appeared on Neil Cavuto's show in the afternoon and gave a very interesting comment. So I want to 
show this to you. So take a listen to this. She's gone. Nathan Wade is gone. But the trial continues. Uh, do they still have grounds to, for appeal to say, look, this started out as a circus and we're not sure it's going to resume any less? Well, a big question, Neil, would be, uh, is it just Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade who would be out of the case or is it the entire Fulton County District Attorney's Office? It occurred to me watching this, and obviously this has been an issue throughout these proceedings, but there may have been a, a couple of different ways you could have handled this. The way the Fulton County DA's office decided to handle it was to jump in with both feet as the advocate for uh, Fannie Willis and Nathan Wade. And it just seems to me that they've kind of attached themselves at the hip to their principles. And maybe that was the way that uh, the boss wanted it. But it's hard for me to believe at this point, the way this was all conducted, that you could potentially disqualify one or both of Wade and Willis and not also disqualify the office. I think it, I think they either all have to go um, or I think the office will go if uh, if Willis has to be disqualified. OK, that's interesting. And that also sets up a very interesting question beyond that. If it's ruled that not only Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade are disqualified from this and the Fulton County office goes too, does that mean that the case necessarily disappears? I don't think it will. It would not surprise me to see the case assigned to another jurisdiction, perhaps the DA of uh, Cobb County or Gwinnett County, any county surrounding Fulton. But that sort of begs the question, if the case is reassigned or referred to one of the other counties, will any of those district attorneys be willing to take this thing up and go forward with it? Because remember, their office is going to have to do due diligence. They're going to have to basically, yeah, they might be able to transfer information from Fulton County to the other surrounding county if they choose to take up the case. But how much new groundwork does the new county DA have to do? Don't know. We'll see what happens. I don't think I don't think the charges necessarily are going away, but the way it looks right now, if I were a betting man, I'd go to the window and put money down on the idea that Fonnie and Nathan are not going to be on this case for much longer. And we'll find out in about two weeks what happens to Drama Mama and Loverboy. But anyway, that's what I think about it. What do you think? As we start to wrap up this video, please do me some favors as always. Number one, if you're not a subscriber to my channel, please do so. Number two, please hit the bell for notifications. I want to make sure you're always aware when a new video or a new live stream is coming out. Number three, please leave a comment below. Number four, circulate the video around for me. And finally, give me a thumbs up. My name is Brian Trippett. I am your front porch conservative, and I will see you next time.